Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. I'm Deacon Lizard King. I'm talking to author Paul Wilde about Jim Morrison, secret teacher of the occult, a journey to the other side. We're going to go you know song by song through the door soft parade, talk about the you secret esoteric messages in each track. Alive. Paul, thanks so much for joining us. If really enjoyed the book. I think people are going to get a lot out of this. I'm going to just jump right in. What first drew you to explore Jim Morrison's connection to esotericism, to the occult? And, and was there a particular moment or insight that sparked your interest in this aspect of his life? Sure. First, thank you very much for having me on your show. Um, that's a really great question. So I moved uh, to Los Angeles um, in 2016 um, in the fall. And I was, unbeknownst to me at the time, started beginning the dark night of the soul of my life. And I found myself as a lot of people do as they approach middle age, they go back to the things that originally made them tick when they were kids when they were teenagers. And for me, that was reading rock and roll and things like that. Throughout growing up in my college years, I had an interest in things that were paranormal, the occult, the esoteric, and it's like brush reading. I was at a place in my life where I think I'm going to explore what the occult and what the esoteric is all about. I was in that right frame of mind to begin that phase of my life in 2016. I went to the bookstores. Los Angeles has excellent occult bookshops. You're in um, the right place. Yeah, exactly. Even the Barnes and Noble in West Hollywood and the Grove area, like even their occult selection is more amazing than stores throughout the rest of the country. So I'm pretty picky about what I read when I choose to learn about a new subject. I started gravitating to what I thought were texts that were intelligent, mature, scholarly, like I can tell that these are people that you could trust. And in, in the fall, let's see, around spring 2017 and the summer 2017, I discovered Gary Lachman's book, The Secret Teachers of the Western World. The title intrigued me right off the bat. And when I began reading the introduction, I thought, this is the book to study. I, I felt the really intelligent presence here. And this, this is a, an in-depth history that is, it's, it's grabbing me in a way that a book hadn't in a long time. And <clears throat> as I was reading it and getting into it, Jim Morrison came to mind from reading it and the types of people that Gary Lackman was introducing in this book. I thought, wow, Jim Morrison is one of these people. I, I began to become more convinced as I kept reading. And I, as I think I said in the introduction of my book, I started writing JM in the sides of paragraphs. And I was, before you know it, I'm like almost like every other page. I'm highlighting like, I, this is related to Jim Morrison. And growing up, like I, I love the doors. I read all of the, the poetry books and I had all the albums and I read every book that I could find. <clears throat> that passion of the door is always there, but just went under for a while as you know, you do other things in life. When I arrived in Los Angeles in 20s, a lot of the, the 50th anniversaries of the Doors and Jim Morrison were going on because they were formed in 1965 in Venice. They started hitting the circuit here in Los Angeles in 1966. The first album came out in 1967 and all the way through Jim's very tragic death in 1971, which was 50 years ago in 2021. There were events going on in Los Angeles at the same time, for instance, in 2018, they changed Rothdale Trail where Pam and Jim lived and Laurel Candy. They renamed it Love Street and there was a big celebration. So that was paralleling all of that. that. Also, as I was reading The Secret Teachers of the Western World, I was going online and realizing that I was becoming a Doors fan and Jim Morrison fan, a Jim Morrison fan all over again. There was just a, a wealth of videos and new pictures and, and a couple of new books about his life that weren't available in the 80s and we were teenagers we had our illustrated history of the doors you had your records maybe you can go to if anybody remembers blockbuster video and find a, a half hour vhs a vh1 video and that was pretty much the extent of the knowledge you can get about the doors and of course there's the, the film that came out in 1991 but beginning eight years ago i was like wow there is a an enormous wealth of new stuff to find out about the doors. You can go online and find Jim Morrison's experimental independent film, Highway to American Pastoral and full on YouTube. So I became a fan all over again. As I was reading Secret Teachers, it was having a profound effect on me and changing my life. It was really getting me back in touch with myself 
It also has a capacity of what I felt Colin Wilson said in his books to break the circuit, to break that robotic part of yourself that's just not necessarily awake. This book really shook me. This book got me back in touch with that other reality, that inner reality. And Secret Teachers gave me a perspective about something that I, I, I had no perspective on before, no context. I'd never heard of the Western esoteric tradition. I'd, I'd never read anything that was put forth this way. It's a very old tradition. Even in Hellenistic Alexandria, when the, the hermitists you know, were practicing and all those things were going on, it was very old to them back then. You know, it's going way back into ancient Egypt. And so that's where it began. I, I got in touch with Gary Lackman. I found him on Facebook. And I, I just have to tell him that your book is having a profound effect on me. Gary's a very generous man. He, he returned all my messages and through our writing, he was very helpful and kind reading what I'd written and su making suggestions. And he wrote a nice endorsement. He's really wonderful guy that way. Very generous person. I got in touch with him to, to tell him how his book was you know, affecting me. And I put it together afterward that he was one some he, had, he wrote a book in which his author title was Gary Valentine when he was in Blondie. And I read that book, it made an impression on me because I remember he talks about moving to New York from his home in New Jersey and that he was living in an abandoned apartment store building full of glass. And he was sleeping there with his guitar. He wanted to be in music and he met Chris Stein and met Debbie Harry. And I remember it, that, all that stuck with me. I like stories like that. So I, I got back in touch with him and said, are, are you Gary Valentine? He said, yeah, that's me. So I thought, wow, this is really cool. It's, it's very fitting that a genius rock and roller who wrote a book about the secret teachings of the Western esoteric tradition was your initiator into a secret teacher of the Western esoteric tradition who's a rock and roller. And I, I really need to get Gary Valentine, Gary Lockman on the show. The, the two greatest power pop songs ever written are X Offender and then his solar song, More Fatty. So it's yeah. two genius tunes. But I'll save the praise of him when I finally get him on the show. You went through this initiation through his books and started corresponding with him, started doing this writing yourself, got all this great feedback. I think that's where we were. While reading this book, I read about a Hellenistic Alexandrian mathematician, a lady named Hypatia. And I read it like, what an amazing person, what a very tragic end to her life, what they did to her. I don't know if your viewers are familiar, what they executed her in a very brutal and horrific way at the end of her life. And then I found out that there was a film about her life called Agora, in which the actress Rachel Weisz plays her. I got online and watched it. No film ever, I never had an emotional reaction like that in my life to any film. I was crying at the end of the movie and it affected me for days. I thought to myself, something vital is happening with me because you can tell a lot about yourself when you have such strong emotions. I felt like how you know, Neil Young sings in that song, I fell in love with the actress. She was playing a part that I can understand. Watching what she was going through in that film, she was experiencing something that dramatized what Gnosis is. There's a scene where she understands how planets go around the sun in an ellipsis. She understands that through what can only be a Gnosis. Her teaching assistant next to her she looks at him and says, God, do you think I'm crazy? He says, no, I, I think this is the truth. And of course, later on, we were scientifically able to prove that what she came up with was correct. So they're having these extraordinary insights into the universe. That's what Gnosis is. Like it, it's instantaneous spiritual knowledge that can also transfer into truths about the physical going on in the universe in the way that Hypatia did. But my reaction to her life and who she was was very strong. So from then on, that's what I, I felt like for myself, I'm on the right path to going back to me. I lost touch with that. So I studied Gary's book. I read it two or three times because I, I wanted to really have it in my mind. And that led me back to reading Colin Wilson again. When I was 19, I discovered Colin Wilson through the biography written about Jim Morrison, No One Here Gets Out Alive. There's a list in the book of some of the more important texts that he read as a teenager. Now, one of them was Colin Wilson's first book published in 1956, The Outsider, that made him famous overnight in England. In a lot of ways, made the point, I think if Colin Wilson had lived 12, was born 12 years later than he was born, he probably would have gotten into rock music himself. The similarities between Colin Wilson's consciousness and who he was and Jim Morrison's and Gary Lackman's too, of course, are very similar. Th those three have a lot in common. When I read A Criminal History of Mankind when I was 19, I liked The Outsider a lot. That talks about all the outsiders in history like Dostoevsky and, and Nijinsky and Nietzsche and, and Blake and the idea that outsiders are people of, they're of immense intense intensity. 
and they're very much one to be in contact with the eternal. And they're people that are, that are not keen to accept status quo and to go into a normal kind of life. Not so much because they're rejecting what that might be about, just because their their minds and who they are, they just has to be paid attention to. They they have no choice but to learn how to learn how to get along in society as they they seek a way to express themselves. They they have to find a way to express themselves. This is the the common pattern with secret teachers. This is the especially ones who are artistic like Jim Morrison. The common pattern with with outsiders that have that secret teacher core in them. They. They're really working to, to find a way to express themselves, to reach other people. So they're not alone anymore. Then they, they realize over time that this is giving them a new kind of purpose and meaning. It's, it's the destiny. I went back to Colin yeah. Wilson. I read Colin Wilson when I was 19. I just remember I was seized by the presence of, I don't know if you've ever read Colin Wilson's books. I was seized by, by the presence behind his writing. Like it's powerful and it's engaging. And he has an authorial voice. You get the feeling like this man knows what he's talking about. This is very much worth reading. And that really stuck with me. I wish that I had stuck with the path I was on back then, but three more call it Wilson. So Gary Lackman's book, you know, where it was in my life in 2016 was what started the idea to uh, well, put me on the path, right? I made the decision to write a book. I made the decision to write it in the fall of 2019. I was sitting in a cafe in Sebastopol and I, I was like, fine, I'm going to write a book. This is all too compelling. I, I decided this is going to be my first book. <clears throat> um, I experienced a lot of her synchronicities. In the book, you mentioned several influential esoteric works that shaped Morrison's thinking, like Colin Wilson, like uh, Seligman's uh, The Mirror of Magic. So how did you go about researching Morrison's occult influences and, and reading habits and, and making the connection that these are more than pleasure reading, uh, something fun to do, something kind of surface level that he was doing as a lot of people in the 60s were grabbing books like this just for fun? Great question. I began with the Jim Morrison's reading list as from No One Here Gets Out of Live. And I started to look into that. Now that I, so now that I, so what Secret Teachers did for me to go into Colin Wilson, to go into like how I found out about Jim Morrison's influence that led me to discovering the mirror of magic. Secret Teachers of the Western World did, I can say, is a lot like how Colin Wilson describes when you're the worm's eye view and the bird's eye view. When you're in like a museum and it's dimly lit and you're up close to a painting and you can only see it up close and that worm's eye view is it's a dark view it's a, it's a subjective view when you step back and you turn the lights on you can see the entire work in that way i was able to see jim morris in a perspective because that's a reading gary lackman's book did the lights went on and i was able to step back it's, it's a bird's eye view and I could see jim morris's place in that his life corresponded not just with the rise of rock and roll and I'd say also with the rise of experimental filmmaking and, and also all the things that beatniks were doing with literature and language. Also with the Western world's first popular occult awakening. It was the first time in the world's history that so many people across the West and other places too were exploring the paranormal, the occult, engaging in yoga, going into witchcraft. The, the right side of the mind was suddenly opening up. And... When Jim Morrison, Jim Morrison was coming to that picture at that time. So that's what Gary Lackman's book. I started with the reading, the books that Jim Check got into from No One Gets Out Alive and with Secret Teachers of Mind. I started doing a lot of research on the web, on YouTube. I was looking through the enormous wealth of videos by Ray Manzarek and John Densmore and Robbie Krieger and all the people that knew him. And I found one video of his college roommate at FSU, a neat man named Ed Martin in college there for a while when Jim Morrison's at FSU in Tallahassee and got to know him, really liked him up, felt that he was probably the smartest person he'd ever met. And Jim Morrison gifted him a book for Christmas in 1963. And that book was The History of Magic and the Occult by Kurt Seligman. Immediately, I, I knew there was something going on. I knew that book was probably related to Secret Teachers. And later on the line, I learned that it's also related to Colin Wilson's The Occult, another foray into the West Esoteric tradition. So I went to go find this book, and I found the book on the Internet Archive online. I started reading it, and I thought, wow, the connections between what Seligman is doing here and what Lackman is doing in The Secret Teachers, 
that this is another person's account of the Western esoteric tradition, the way Kurt Seligman saw it. Kurt Seligman was a, was a Swiss American artist and he emigrated to the United States, like a lot of the surrealists from Paris did because of World War II, like Andre Breton and Andre Masson and Salvador Dali, et cetera. And Kurt Seligman, this quote unquote, come with the lesser artist. Kurt Seligman is a brilliant artist. So when those artists came to New York to escape the Third Reich, um, their surrealist ideas were introduced to the native painters there and people like Jackson Pollock. And so what happened in the 1950s was abstract expressionism came out of that. And also a independent filmmaker that Jim Morrison really loved and wanted to work with after UCLA, Jonas Mikas. I mean, he was a part of that scene as well. Jonas Mikas is considered like the godfather of experiment and exper experimental filmmaking in the United States. <clears throat> Seligman approached the Western esoteric tradition as an artist. He wanted to display where a, a lot of the inspiration for that comes from. Surrealism is rooted in, is influenced by the Freudian exploration of the unconscious. That's the crowd that Seligman was in. And at, at some point he must have began to see the, the relationships between modern art and uh, a secret, you know, what, se who, what a secret teacher the whole Western esoteric church or people were doing because you're in contact with that other reality of creating from that. Jim Morrison found this book when he was a teenager attending George Washington High School in Alexandria, Virginia. He never brought it back. He kept it for years until he gave away in 1963. And in reading this book, I get it. That it was just like, wow, I can see where he gave it away because maybe it was his way of, I, I want to move on from this because I know that I'm going to become something like this later on, that, that kind of thing, because I've wondered why he gave away that book. In the collected works of Jim Morrison, he said that he found a book on reptiles and the opening statement really seized him. Like the statement to the history of magic in the occult that Seligman chose was from Albert Einstein. He said that the fairest thing that we can experience is the mysterious. I think that I grabbed Jim Morrison just as much. I can see him reading that, picking that up going, I can see why he didn't bring it back, that he was engrossed in it. And just to like the way that Seligman writes, it's not in depth, but Seligman's language is, he approached it like an artist. Like it's very sparse, but it makes a real impression on the imagination, or at least it did mine the way he discusses magicians in the ancient world in Sumeria, like going up through Egypt. It's, it's very majestic. It's very elegant. It's what you expect from an artist who's going to write about these kinds of things. Jim Morrison was a very artistic person. Patti Smith felt that he was probably the, the best artist of the 1960s, and in some ways I can see why she would think that. And uh, there's a lot of drawings that, that Selden made that are included in the text. The Western esoteric tradition, the way Selden presents it, is pretty much the way that Gary Lachman does when secret teachers, all the usual players are there starting with Pythagoras and going up to the founding of Hellenistic Alexandria, what Gary Lachman calls the rejected knowledge or lunar knowledge. Blossoms there in Hellenistic Alexandria with the library. It moves into Haran in Turkey during the time of classical Islam. And then it makes its way through Byzantium and makes its way through a guy named Plethon who introduces the Corpus Hermeticum into Hasamu de Medici, and he has Marcello Piccino translated. That becomes a big seed for the Italian Renaissance. So Seligman's book follows that same path. Now, I, I think Jim Morrison paid a great deal of attention to this because the magician in him w w w was responding to this. He, he was learning something about himself within, within a context of things that was centuries old. I think when Jim Morrison discovered that book, it, it's my strong belief that his spiritual awakening started in Alameda, California in 1956 when he started high school. Jim Morrison was right next to a renaissance going on in San Francisco with the Beatniks. And him and his friend Fudd Ford would go into San Francisco and they would go to City Lights Books. He even met Lawrence Ferlinghetti, freaked him out, and Jim Morrison said he ran away when he saw him. <laughs> and Ferd was the American literary Cosmo de Medici of his day with his bookstore. Like, you always have these personalities and figures who are the ones that really helped bring in the other writers and the artists to blossom with these new movements. Jim Morrison was there for that. And he saw all of that. When he lived in Alexandria, Virginia, like New York is not far away where Seligman and all those people were. The great artistic movement was blossoming up there at the same time, abstract expressionism, yeah. in which in the experimental, you know, film and all that. Then there was the into all the beatniks and all this going on, and he was absorbing Jack Kerouac, which really inspired him. 
I think a spiritual awakening started and it was building in high school and then into college. So when you got the history of magic and the occult, we also learned from Noah Dirk Asada Live that he was also going to the Library of Congress and he was checking out books on 14th, 15th century demonology and things like that. And he was going in depth. When you're gets out alive, it, it, it speaks a lot. Of, I, I had to really walk with Jim Morrison to write this. I can imagine this person as, you know, as a young teenager. And at this point in his life, he's, well, he has 149 IQ. So he does very good in school with very minimal effort, but he's putting all of his attention on what in a way seems to be like, like an unconscious preparation for what he's going to be doing later on in life whether he understood that or not. And he was going through that spiritual awakening that was drawing him to these types of books. And it was, it was also causing him to write a journal. I mean, pretty much everything that Jim Morrison was doing, if you go to your local Barnes & Noble, you know, there's all kinds of books that advocate the same thing with the reading and, and journaling and, and meditation and drawing and painting. He was doing that all on his own. And to Jim Morrison's credit, he was a trailblazer this way. There wasn't anything like that back then. He was just following what he felt he needed to do to you know, to discover himself as an artist. Maybe just by the nature of the text he was reading, like demonology and things like that, because he was he had a, a predilection to get the darker side of life. I, I, I don't think aggregated is the right word, but that was really breaking the circuit in his mind. His girlfriend, Tanya Martin, and his friends reported that his, you know, his behavior was eccentric, sometimes downright bizarre and strange. It seems that Jim Morrison, as a teenager, needed time alone to read and learn about himself. Things are happening fast. He's young. Like a lot of times these things don't happen to most people until like an adult. Those things are not happening to me as a teenager. What really struck me is this person understood so much by the time they're 21 years old. His consciousness and intellectual ability and where he was at with the subject matter that he chose to learn about was someone like who's 40 years old with a PhD. That's what kept coming to my mind. I was amazed by this. I think his reading habits was led him to the, find the history of magic in the occult. Now, with my book, I first I thought I was reaching, but no, I don't think I am. Jim Morrison's life seems to be like a, a trajectory, like the Western esoteric tradition itself. It begins in Alexandria, Virginia, where he discovers the history of magic in the occult. It's a deep synchronicity. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's good. yeah. yeah. It, and he's very... He's very interested in history. He's very taken with Alexander the Great. Alexander was, you know, taught by none other than Aristotle himself. Aristotle told Alexander that all human beings have a deep desire to know. We have a, a drive for curiosity. It's something that's really healthy. It's something that I think a, a lot of people in the world throughout history seek to suppress. And this stuck with Alexander the Great. To me, Jim Morrison's story begins with Alexander the Great's conquest of Egypt. Because it was there that Alexander had the dream about where to found the city of Alexandria. Everything he learned from Aristotle stuck with him, and he he wanted to build you know this city, and he chose it on the Mediterranean coast, which was a very new thing back then because all the cities in Egypt were built on the Nile. That that was completely novel, and of course the Great Library took root there, and was, this became a place that satisfied man's curiosity to know for many centuries. And Alexander the Great was a champion for that. So here's Jim Morrison in Alexandria, Virginia, who's also, there's so many parallels here, it's amazing, who's also the son of a military commander. His father even calls him the commander throughout his childhood. And Alexander the Great, his father was Philip II of Macedon, also a great commander. So there's that parallel. I don't want to go as far as to say that Jim Morrison was Alexander the Great reincarnated or anything like that, you know. I, I like things to settle upon, like the, the synchronicities can be a really wonderful mysteriousness and strangeness to it. That makes us think we can never really get the truth, but we know we're in the arena of something truthfully mysterious in its way. That kind of like gives like a, a power to it, a magic to it. And he's, in some ways, it's almost like Jim Morrison was picking up where Alexander left off. Alexander was upset that he had no more worlds to conquer. But Alexander never had the opportunity to discover his inner world. And that's where... Jim Morrison was always looking at the, into that inner world. With his books, writing and journaling, he was doing the same thing that Carl Wilson did when, when he was journaling growing up and called it his own magical kingdom. Carl, Carl Wilson tried to write an, an entire encyclopedia when he was a teenager yeah. and took great delight in doing that. 
it, the, the relationship between Jim Morrison and Carl Wilson is that they both understood the power of concentration. They, they understood like the power of really focusing on something in order. It induces what Carl Wilson would dedicate his life to investigating peak experiences. And peak experiences are like the, these, these sudden rich moments where that inner reality becomes really alive within you and, and the world outside becomes really alive. He, he uses the example of Van Gogh's Starry Night as an artistic depiction of Van Gogh's own experiences. Just a very heightened sense, like everything in the world is just blazing. It's, it's what Colin Wilson says, G.K. Chesterton called the absurd good news. It's just these resources of energy bubbling up in you. Jim Morrison was one of these people. That started happening with his spiritual awakening through high school. I think to, you can see Jim, he was, but to me, like a, the secret teacher, he's a classic romantic. In The Outsider, you read about romantics are, these are people who are, they're people of great intensity. They're people who have a really deep connection to the reality. They're very healthy in the sense that they, they have a lot of peak experiences, mystical experiences, et cetera, but they crash after these, it's like highs and lows. There's actually like a really good video with Jer Jeffrey Mishlove with Colin Wilson called The Highs and Lows where he talks about this. A, a lot of them become suicidal. They turn to drinking. They get sick. They get tuberculosis. For instance, after paying the starry night, Van Gogh committed suicide a year later. And the suicide note, he said, misery will never end. Misery just goes on. That's very similar to what Jim Morrison says in his poetry. Could any hell be more horrible than now and real? <clears throat> and that there, there's that same highs and lows in Jim Morrison. In the book, I said that he, he makes a statement where the highs and lows are what count, like everything else is just in between. That's a very typical expression of a secret teacher who's an outsider. There's a really good video called Three Hours from Magic that talks about interviews. There's something quite revealing that Robbie Krieger talks about at the time when Jim Morrison wrote People Are Strange. He, John Densmore and Robbie Krieger were living together in Laurel Canyon in here in Los Angeles. And Jim Morrison was in a, a really depressed mood that night, a suicidal mood. And they spent the night trying to talk him out of committing suicide. And Krieger says that they had to do this from time to time. Towards the end of the night, Jim Morrison went for a walk. He went to the top of a hill. There's lots of beautiful views of Los Angeles, especially when the sun comes up. He came back in a completely changed mood, belated. He wrote the lyrics for People Are Strange, and he came back and told him, I've seen the light, you know? Mm -hmm. That fits right in line with the, the, the outsiders who are romantics as Colin Wilson saw them, with their highs and lows and their, their suicidal tendencies and those kinds of things. That, have, that has roots in German romanticism. If you've ever read Colin Wilson's The Super, Super Consciousness, Gertrude's The Sorrows of Young Verger. Jim Morrison was very much this kind of person, dealt with highs and lows this way. And with Jim Morrison, those highs were really high for sure. So those crashes must have been really hard. He had a Dionysian archetype. And I learned a lot about this from Jean Shinoda Bowen's book, Gods and Every Man, Archetypes That Shape Men's Lives. She mentions Jim Morrison in conjunction with Mick Jagger, typical men from the 60s who had a Dionysian archetype that they were projecting into the culture. So it, it's very natural for people with that archetype that when they're, they're having these, for someone like Jim Morrison, where they're, they're having these peak experiences and these highs in their life, that they want to heighten it. <clears throat> it it's like a microcosm of everyone wanting to go to a concert and get a buzz on before the music starts. It's the same thing with artists like Jim Morrison. They have the need to heighten who they already are with alcohol and, and, and psychedelic. It's important to see Jim Morrison in the same context that Colin Wilson presents outsiders in his book, The Outsiders, because Colin Wilson's original fascination was like, what are these experiences that romantics keep chasing? And, and why are they meeting such bad ends when they have these great highs? Like what's, what's going on here? And for, in Colin Wilson's issue, he, a, a life, he, um, and career, he chose to reject all of that. He moved into this thing called the new existentialism where he wanted to find a way where you can induce peak experiences where you can, he felt like this is a necessary part of the, the evolution that he felt that we we're on the cusp on, like he had discovered something really important. 
Then you wrote to Abraham, who's in communication with Abraham Maslow, because Abraham Maslow got in, got in contact with him because Abraham Maslow made the determination that he was tired of working with patients who were sick and always talking about their bad experiences. And he wanted to work with patients who were healthy and he noticed that they were having peak experiences. Wilson said, I told Maslow, well, do you think we can induce peak experiences? And Maslow, no, you can't. They just come. There's no control over them. One artist likens it to a burning coal inside of you. The coal heats up and it's red hot for whatever wind of inspiration hits it and it goes away and the coal dies back down again. But Carl Wilson rejected that. He spent his life trying to explore ways in which you can induce peak experiences. To go back to Jim Morrison and Colin Wilson's original impetus for what started off in his career with his fascination romantics, it's important to see that Jim Morrison was a classic romantic. When Jim Morrison graduated from high school, his parents told him, you're going to move down to Florida with your grandparents in St. Petersburg, and you're going to enroll at St. Petersburg Community College, and you're going to start off from there. And he just shrugged his shoulders and says, fine, just my graduation present, I, I want the complete works of Friedrich Nietzsche. And his sister in an interview, Anne, makes the, the observation that, like, this is a very unusual request from a teenager. Usually kids, like, well, they want a car, maybe like a trip to Europe or something like that. <laughs> yeah. You know, what 18-year-old wants to dive into all of that? And that's very telling because Nietzsche, Colin Wilson has a relationship with continental philosophers, especially Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, that positive look on life that Nietzsche brought to philosophy. Colin Wilson was out there sleeping in a sleeping bag, not part of the academy, not right of the outsider, and living an outsider's life as he wrote about these things. He tried to come up with a philosophy that was very positive by having peak experiences. And Nietzsche was the same you know, type of person in his way, where his illnesses conspired to drive him off from his teaching visit in the German academia. Nietzsche was also it's like, a, it's like a European beatnik, going to all the beautiful places in Europe, living off like a very meager pension from his separation from the University of Basel. In writing all of his books, Nietzsche was very much preoccupied with how we're going to get along in a world in which we've killed off God. We're going to start making our own bulls, doing our own thing. And he took lots of inspiration from the ancient Greeks with Dionysius. I think this is where Jim, through Nietzsche's books, got the impetus to start understanding how to go about being himself in the world, to get context for his life. And you know, if you, I, I make the point in the first chapter where. You know, Jim Morrison had this incredible experience when he was three years old that, that many of us know about, in which he's in New Mexico with his family, they're on vacation, and he comes upon a, a traffic accident, and there are native workers that are they're dying, that they died. And Jim was convinced that a couple of those were, were shamans, that they leapt into his soul spiritually, and that they stayed there for the rest of his life. The more I began to learn about who Jim was there, like the, the more I began, he's right. This is the truth. This happened to him. He said it was the most important experience of his entire life. You know, when a person like Jim Morrison says that, you need to pay attention and start asking why. So he, he has this experience, and it comes out in Peace Frog. Indians scattered on Don's highway bleeding, ghosts crowd the young child's fragile shell mind. He's saying that this is an experience that woke me up. This is the spirit world coming into my life and influencing the course of my life. And you know, that's huge. That's big. And Nietzsche gave him the validation for his curiosity about all of this. When you look into things that are terrible and questionable, you want to discover what those things are. And we have to remember that Nietzsche said, like, he who breathes, another typical kind of romantic statement, he who breathes in the air of my writings is, conscious that is the air of the heights and it can kill a man. I think what he probably meant by that is these air of the heights, these peak experiences, you're going to have a low, like you know, the, those lows can kill you from this. You can psychically fall from these experiences. You know, when you experience your mind firing in all these cylinders, especially when you're at a place in history where there's just no context for someone like you. you know, Nietzsche felt he wouldn't be really understood until the mid part of the beginning of the 21st century. So I think Nietzsche gave Jim Morrison great inspiration to, to step forward. I think since he was a romantic, he, he may have been suicidal as a teenager as well. You know, he felt like there was something going on with him when he was a student at George Washington High School that he couldn't talk to his parents and he wouldn't talk to his girlfriend Tandy about. She was like, fine, but I'm going to take you to see a Presbyterian minister. And to this day, we don't know what that discussion was. And it... Just from 
having taken such a deep dive in what was going on with him in his life at that time, he was probably looking for spiritual counsel. He was probably really confused about what was happening with him as far as his spiritual awakening. He was probably wanting to discuss these highs and lows that he had that maybe he was suicidal. We have to remember this young person, while going about the normal life of a teenager, was having an extraordinary spiritual awakening. It's amazing he contained it. And I think he was able to work with that with his journaling and his reading and making sure he had time alone. I can see why he did not want to talk to anybody about it. Because I learned in another book called The Stormy Search for the Self, which is a very unique book written by Christina and Stanley Groff, in which they work with people who are going through spiritual awakenings. And, and one commonality is that they don't want to talk about this stuff with just anybody because they were it's going to get stigmatized, especially with family. In the Stormy Search for the Self, they talk about this one person that the family event eventually put them in hospitals for shock treatments. And they said they were opening up the spirit world and and, and they were going to cosmic consciousness. Their families thought that was crazy and insane. Ironically, in 1623, with a book written by a Marin Mersenne, or a tract, I guess you can call it, called Questiones Celebere Man, slammed the door on everything that was going on that gave root to the Italian Renaissance, the Corpus Hermetic and all that. I learned this in Kerouac and secret teachers, secret teachers and artists and people claiming to have cosmic consciousness. Like it was seen as insane. Like it's insane. And of course it goes from there with the way the church started control and the inquisition, and everything that followed for the past 400 years up until fairly recently. So Jim Morrison was just like, I'm not going to tell this to just anybody. So he confided in his minister. And I think one of them was, I'm, I'm waking up to the spirit world. When a, a person's consciousness starts to ascend into cosmic consciousness, and you, you, you start being in contact with that other reality. In Jim Morrison's poem, he says that reality is what has con been concealed from us for so long. It, it's Columbus discovering America. It's a very big deal in a person's life, and it, it really changes you dramatically whether you like it or not. And it's called the stormy search for the self for a reason. It's a very appropriate title. And that's what Jim Morrison was going through starting his high school years, a stormy search for the self. And it, it's a wonder. He loved Arthur Rimbaud, the symbol is a poet. <laughs> it, it's a wonder he didn't run away from high school when Alameda or Alexandria, like Rimbaud did, run off to New York and San Francisco and just start being a poet and to get away from his family and with his, you know, about the, the the military rigidity from his father. Jim Morrison's father was a very high-ranking naval officer, one of the finest naval officers the United States has ever produced. He went on to command his own aircraft carrier. They were grooming this person for top seats in the corporation there at the Pentagon, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and all that. He was an abusive father. He was just somebody who was largely absent. He was a, the high-ranking military man. Even if he wasn't abusive, he probably didn't have the, the most gentle parenting style. And... We learned that the Morrison children were, were disciplined. There wasn't much validating their opinions and feelings necessarily in an abusive atmosphere. Yeah, it, it, it was just... 40s and 50s. There wasn't a lot of hugs and sharing of feelings and emotions in no. a lot of households in America at that time, let alone having a fairly high-ranking strict military father who was used to having a lot of people follow his commands. So it may not have been abusive as we would understand it, but a nurturing artistic environment, and I think yeah. would probably not be a good description. So if we can skip ahead to the, mm. the more mature Jim Morrison, the flourishing artist, how do you think Morrison's esoteric interests and practices influence his music and poetry with the doors? Are there any particular songs or lyrics that you see as especially revealing of his occult leanings? Well, right off the bat, break on through to the other side. We have to remember that Jim Morrison was a, po was a classic polymath, a classic Renaissance man. He used to write poetry, lyrics, songs, films, acting. He even said he was a prophet to me and he said that he felt like the interview was going to be the art form of the future. And here we are with podcasts and interviews. Right off the bat with Break On Through to the Other Side, I, I think artists in the 60s, particularly ones who are, who are as awakened as Jim Morris, you, you need secret teachers like him to be able to punch on through. His whole idea was to, to wake you up to what Colin Wilson said, to, to break that circuit, you know, to break the robot. There's another reality that we have to get in contact with. You can't go to a door show and get instant awakening and instant enlightenment. That's not going to happen. But Jim Morrison saw that a large part of his role was to really shake things up and wake people up. Break on through does. Dig its 
you know, deep, straight, and wide, right going through the other side. It just the way that song pushes forward, like it, it, it grabs the listener. And of course, over time, you start to wonder like, what exactly is Jim Morrison talking about? He's talking about breaking through to cosmic consciousness, breaking out through it. There's a spirit world that is ready to help you, ready to guide you. There's magic in life. Everything is not just cut and dry as the way the Western world has. We have to remember that we're, in, we're at the end of a structure of consciousness, the breakdown of the mental rational structure of consciousness. Everything in the Western world, throughout the world, has been just it's too left brain. There's just not enough inspiration coming from the right brain. There's not enough interaction with that inner reality and all these other things that we call the occult, the esoteric, and that we need a balance. Someone like Jim Morrison steps into the picture and he sees rock and roll, which has a relationship with things that are primitive that Colin Wilson talks about in the occult. And Jim Morrison very astutely sees rock and roll as a vehicle in which he can really wake people up to this. He can shock people out of their roboticness, out of, out of their complacency. He can really get people to, to think like a lot of people that left Doors shows were like, wow, like, I have no idea what I just saw. I'm going to be thinking about this for a while. It's like, that was amazing. I loved it, but I don't have any context for what I just saw. But they knew that they, they loved it because the world at that time was ready for someone like Jim Morrison. I use a phrase that I like a lot from the secret teachers of the Western world called New Alien and Other. And if there was anything more New Alien and rock and roll, it was Jim Morris. People were ready for that because the, this whole occult awakening was going on. From going back to the history of magic and the occult, the fairest thing that we can experience is the mysterious. I think Jim Morris, that's stuck in his mind. So someone with an IQ that's high, their retention is just amazing. And as the artist, he was able to with great success, appropriate himself as something in rock and roll, one of the fairest things that you can experience, his own mysteriousness, because he had a gift for erotism in conjunction with mysteriousness. It, it, it's really amazing. He looked like an ancient Greek statue, yep. like someone from that time coming to life in our time. He had that ancientness in him. He had that ancient Egyptian way of looking at life. The ancient Egyptians... Um, Shvalo de Lubitsch said that the, the famous maverick Egyptologist that ancient Egypt, ancient Egyptians did not have religion. They were religion. They saw their land as a reflection of heaven. And Jim Morrison was this kind of person. Like, you know, Jim Morrison was, he has a lot of in, a relationship with things that are Greek, ancient Greek, Alexander the Great, stuff like that. But a lot of the secret teachers in the ancient Greek world went to Egypt to learn. That's where you learned esotericism. That's where you learned hermeticism. That has, that's a very big part of it. And of course, all that coalesces in Hellenistic Alexandria. So Jim Morrison is all of these things in, in some ways, like with Jim Morrison, as, as nuts as it sounds, all the elements of all the past secret teachers and, and the various epics of the Western esoteric tradition and the challenges that they faced with, with themselves and with their immediate family and friends and, and with the authorities of their day, this kind of all comes together in Jim Morrison's life. So <clears throat> I, I make the point that in the 60s, the, the, the conditions are ripe for Jim Morrison to commercially make it as a rock star because people were, were ready to respond to him. They're ready to buy the tickets and buy the albums. This person is really right there in line as we ourselves discover the unknown because so many people are, are, are going in that direction. Jim Morrison became an avatar. He felt it was his mission to push that along, break on through the other side. What better way to do that than with that four beat chord that's rock and roll with its roots and rhythm and blues and everything that, you know, that its ancient primitive roots in Africa. It, re it relates into the whole idea of the tragic artist with the roots of rock and roll from slaves singing in the fields. Their lives are so terrible that they find solace in music, in the gospels that they would write and sing. And we can wait can't even imagine what they were going through. But it gave birth to this really powerful music that it became blues, became jazz, became soul music. Elvis Presley was very much a part of that whole tradition, the way he responded to what was going on in his life personally with the blues all around him. Jim Morrison saw rock and roll and all this as a way in which 
he can really shake people awake into that other reality, that secret teacher core of him that wanted people to know cosmic consciousness and the beauty that we have, that the possibilities that are, that are alive within us in, in, in other people's lives. And that, that's what that's, he said that he, the reason people become artists is because they, it's a way where they can really connect with other people. That's why you write poetry. And that's why we write music. For someone like Jim Morrison, he wanted to communicate what was going on in his life with other people. He saw that his own personal awakening has a, a general universal place, what's happening around him. He talks about the birth of rock and roll coincided with when I'm coming into rock and roll. The way that Jim Morrison chose to be a poet, that was coinciding with the beatniks and the, what they were doing. He had a real gift want for to study film, experimental filmmaking. And in his book, The Lords and the New Creatures, which is just replete with so many esoteric references to, to alchemy. It's amazing someone who's 19, 20 years old, who, who was so astute about his observations and the, the relationships between cinema and alchemy, experimental cinema in particular. He wanted to go to New York to work with Jonas Mikas, as I mentioned earlier. Another synchronicity was, as I said earlier, the world is experiencing its first great occult awakening, as he is also experiencing on his own personal way an occult awakening also, and he's, he's, as he's gaining context and perspective. We have to remember to look at this astrologically in his chart. I think astrology is good to kind of ballpark you, different yep. aspects of yourself. And one of those is that he had a Leo North node. Leo North node folks are like Mick Jagger has a Leo North node. So it's no wonder to me who he is in a way. Certainly doesn't help to hurt. So Leo North node people are there. They, to follow your fulfillment, you go in, you want to go into the North node. Your South node is like things that happen in past lives, things you're familiar with. It's loosely known as the comfort zone. And that comfort zone for Jim Morrison was the Aquarius South node. And Aquarius is teamwork. It's people wearing uniforms. It's just about being able to do things together with other people. Okay. Leo North Node people are individuals. Like they're born to be in front of something, to champion something that they really believe in. As much as Jim Morrison was a private person with his poetry and very inward, there is also this compulsion that he had that he could make it as a rock star at the same time. And his Leo North Node, I think, helped him to push him in that direction, whether he understood this astrologically or not. Uh, it, it just, not that it came natural, but he had to go through things that were uncomfortable and following that North Node, that Leo North Node, to put him out there in front. And that, that's what he did. In those first year and a half, like when the doors are forming, like he, it, it was said that when the doors first started to perform, he would not face the audience for several weeks to a few months. It was very, this is really hard for somebody like Jim Morrison. It's very private. You're a poet, you're writing in your journals, reading, and it's just been you, one friend, a girlfriend, your whole life. And then suddenly you're going you're to open up your entire, this rich inner world that you have to all these strangers and audiences and clubs and then concert halls and all of this. Like this is a very steep transition. So it, it took him a while to open up and that's, I think where Jim Morrison's great generosity shows itself because he allowed us into that magical kingdom that he had, which was a very rich place. And it was the place, it was a magical kingdom of a secret teacher. And I'm where I'm going to use rock music to show you about this other inner reality, the spirit world. Of course, this leads into shamanism and found uh, a text that was translated into English in 1964 by written by Richie Eliad, a, a, a Romanian Hungarian writer called uh, shamanism, archaic techniques of ecstasy, which I think to this day is probably the best book on shamanism. There are some other good books, but I think this one is really good. It was translated into English in 1964. And that was the time when Jim Morrison was a student at UCLA at their film school. And he was reading a great deal about esoteric occult things, his reading was continuing. He was very much into Carlos Castaneda at the same time. I've often wondered whether or not he might have gone to one of Castaneda's lectures, like at Thunderbolt Books and in Santa Monica, places like that. Yeah. So I, I think Jim Morrison, in reading Eliot's book, I think he got a hold of that book too. I think he read that closely because what was going on in, in Eliot's book was what Jim Morrison would, was going to end up doing with the doors. He wrote it, he also writes a lot about shamanism. 
it is poetry book, the Lords of the New Creatures. And then he later makes his statements, gosh, when I was... So the Lords of the New, New Creatures, the first part, no sign vision, he wrote when he was a student at UCLA, which is quite remarkable. And that he made the statement that you know, when I was writing about shamanism in Notes on a Vision, I didn't realize that a very short time later I'd be doing exactly that with, with the doors that just happened. To go into shamanism, so when Jim graduates from, high, uh, from UCLA, it's 1965, he has the idea he wants to move to New York City to meet Jonas Mikas to get involved in experimental filmmaking. He's friends at Ray Manzarek who's getting his MFA in cinematography at the same time. And Manzarek, he tells Manzarek, I'm going to move to New York. And Manzarek is like, oh, I'm going to miss you. He calls him his, he said he was going to miss his, what do you say? His, his psychedelic, his avant-garde psychedelic stoner poet pal, which sums up Jim Morrison pretty much. But Jim thinks it through. He's okay, so I'm going to move to New York City. I'm going to have to get a job because it's cold. I need a place to live. This, not, this is not a place where you're homeless. And yeah. plus, if I get involved in film, I'm going to have the film, and I'm going to have to rent equipment. I'm going to have to be responsible for all of this Naga recorders and all this kind of stuff. He didn't see himself doing any of that. They didn't want to go into Hollywood. His parents thought he might go into Hollywood, but Jim rejected all of that. This is someone who rejected um, popular culture. This is the guy who wrote, did you know that we are ruled by TV? He, he didn't want any part of it. What Jim was into was was a French New Wave cinema. He loved Godard, like especially his film Contempt. He loved Francois Truffaut. There's even on YouTube, you can find a video of Jim Morrison when he was living in Paris. He was on the set of one of Truffaut's films. You, you can see him walking around on the set and you can see Truffaut also. Uh, this is what Jim Morrison liked. He felt like these people were on, on the cutting edge of with their artwork, in which it, it allowed him a way to to communicate that secret teacher part of himself that you know, also had a lot to do with alchemy. And certainly the the surrealist, going back, that has its roots in symbolism that goes back to Charles Baudelaire with his great poem, Correspondences, that which corresponds to, as above, so below is at the core of all of that, right? Jim Morrison was very astute and had educated himself, you know, on all of this by the time he graduated from UCLA. So what's he going to do? So he's in a relationship with Mary Warbelow. And Mary was, had an IQ that was higher than Jim Morrison's. And she was just as well read. There's a very good book written by Bill Cosgrave, who was, who was good friends of both of them, called <clears throat> Jim Morrison, Mary, and Me. In the, the, that two-year time before um, the first days of the doors, and this is a, when, when Nietzsche was alive, he really wanted to marry this, this great intellectual named Lou, Sol, Lou Salome, but she wasn't having any of it. Jim Morrison got to have a relationship like that with Mary. He really loved Mary. I think Mary really loved him too. I think she, she contemplated wanting to marry him. But when he graduated, his parents pulled the plug on his, on funding his Goshen Avenue apartment um, over by the VA hospital in, 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 that, in Westwood. And Mary was like, told him, but you don't know enough about yourself. All you know are books. You need to go find out who you are. You're not moving in with me. That's not happening. So broke, not much money, had no interest in getting a job, no interest in going to New York, no interest in getting involved in Hollywood. He just moved to Venice Beach and where he was couch surfing and living on Dennis Jacobs' rooftop. We know this part of the story. It's very famous. I don't think it happened. I love Oliver Stone's film. And I love Oliver Stone as a filmmaker. There are great scenes in the film The Doors, but it, it does not tell the story about what Jim Morrison was going through in Venice. <clears throat> That's where, to get the whole shamanic and the initiation thing, Jim very de deliberately just threw a cannonball at his brain. Like you said, drugs are a bet with your mind. And back then, you could buy LSD over the counter. And the LSD back then... LSD today, like maybe your average street hit is like 100 to 300 micrograms if you're lucky. Back then, it was several hundred micrograms more. Like LSD hits back then. You were going on a trip. It was an experience. And Jim Morrison was just swallowing this like M&Ms. And he was doing other drugs like messing around with his blood pressure. Mm -hmm. All kinds of things all at once. Th this is where things get really complicated with Jim Morrison. There's yeah. so much going on. So we also know that Jim Morrison had a side of himself where he would purposely pick fights in which he wasn't a fighter. He wasn't a violent guy. 
but he would pers- he would just go out and pick fights and just get his ass kicked like really bad. It's a shame because there's actually a scene, an outtake from the Doors movie where I don't know if this actually happened, but characterologically tells the truth about Jim Morrison where Oliver Stone talks about when he's arrested in New Haven and he's back at the police station. And there's an outtake where the police are, they're ready to let him go, but Jim Morrison just pushes it. And they bet you just beat the shit out of him. It's like, why? Why are you doing that? And so I'm going to get to shameless in a second. This leads into it. <clears throat> yeah. It's my it, part of all this is when I started, uh, I was watching Lawrence of Arabia. And Lawrence of Arabia was released in 1962. And Colin Wilson discusses T.E. Lawrence and the outsider, his time leading the Arab revolt, the, the warring Bedouin tribes. This is in World War I. When, when the allies were going at it with the Turks. And there's a scene in Lawrence of Arabia where for, with uh, Omar Sharif Ali in the film, where they go into a, for some reason, he decides to get himself caught in a Turkish town. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the Bey, which is the Turkish name for the, the leader, eventually there's, a, there's an attraction towards him and you get the, the sense in the movie that he wants to sleep with T.E. Lawrence. And of course, what does T.E. Lawrence do? He just you know, kicks him in the nuts in, in the scene. And then, which ends up him getting beaten up like really bad by the Turkish soldiers. But all this could have been avoided. So why did you go into a Turkish town? Why did you do all this? And there's that scene where Omar Sharif looks up at this guy and says, God, please, you know, be patient with him. We don't know why he's doing this. And Jim Morrison did this a bunch of times. Bill Cosgrave describes one night in Venice, he pushed it with the police and they threw him into the police car. They beat the shit out of him in the back of a police car, whisked him off to the police station. And Bill Cosgrave was desperately on the on a public phone trying to you know, figure out what happened. Robert Kirby talks about when he was getting beaten up really bad by these group of, I, I don't know if it was the Hell's Angels or not, but they had him pinned in a telephone booth. Telephone booths back then, we us older guys, so like you shut it and there's like, they <laughs> had him in there. Robert Kirby could see his face pinned up against the glass and he's smiling. They're beating the crap out of him. He's smiling. Yeah. In the same way that happens like in the movie of Lawrence of Arabia. Like, like what is this? What is going on here? So to tie this with shamanism, he did the same thing with drugs. Like he pushed it and pushed it with drugs. So it's, it's my deep, it's my, I'm sure that many of the drug experiences that he had with LSD were deeply terrifying. And they really just talk about breaking on through to the other side. We learn from the doors of perception that we like, you know, you and I can have this conversation and people watching this, they, they can tune in. Our minds are built to tune in. We can tune out without having to do so everything else going on around us. When you're on LSD, that flies out the window. So when you do as much LSD as Jim Morrison did in that summer in 1965, while also while you're not eating and he's just eating canned food, other than like that, he's really what what blowing open what Blake called in the marriage of heaven and hell are mind forged manacles that that part within us that is <clears throat> it's designed. For your survival, so you, your brain can function, your left brain can do its thing, and your right brain can do its thing, et cetera, and so forth. It, I, believe, I believe Huxley called that, that there's also the mind at large. Because I guess in some ways you can also say is the universal mind. Like Jim Morrison said, I'm doing time in the universal mind. If that's what he's talking about. And he used psychedelics and LSD to really break on through to that, to, to blow his consciousness open. And I think also this is where the spirit world and the way that it was that, that Jim Morrison was relating with it and communing with it started to come into his life. <clears throat> and this is very, we're talking about entities where we're talking about maybe the, maybe the shamanic spirits that he said were in his soul. All this was just starting to stir, starting to come out. And I, I think it, it, it demanded release. It demanded self-expression. And this started to pop up in the form of songs that he was writing. Jim Morrison may have not been like an actual musician with his, mm-hmm. but he was a musician. Like he heard these songs in his mind, amazing songs, very artistic songs. And he wrote all the lyrics down. And as he was going through these, these terrific, terrible, frightening experiences that shamans go through at the same time, I think he was also experiencing great freedom and he's becoming himself. His hair is growing out and his body is slimming down and there's if you're familiar with Venice Beach, he's really fitting into that whole beautiful Southern California lifestyle. And this is all very new to Jim Morrison because most of his life, 
he had a pudgy face and he was overweight. He was, he was that, he said like when he was at FSU, he would always get to the, the cafeteria before everybody else. Cause he felt like if he didn't go, he'd miss all the free food. <laughs> and yeah. suddenly, it's, suddenly he wasn't doing that in Venice at all. all. All that was gone. That's a lot of discipline to tell yourself, okay, like those habits are going to be replaced. I'm just going to slim down. You couldn't go get an EBT card back then or anything like that. So I, I don't know how he paid for his food and got houses because he was couch surfing, sleeping on Dennis Jacobs' roof, et cetera, so forth. And Venice Beach back then was not the, at all the Venice Beach that it is today. Not at all. It's the exact opposite. Venice Beach back then was very much... Venice Beach has its own history of the beatniks, right? There's Greenwich Village in New York, and there's North Beach up in San Francisco, which are the more well-known breeding grounds for the beatniks and then the entire story that it is all around that where Bob Dylan came out of Greenwich Dillon, Village and everything that. <clears throat> but there is a, a very strong beatnik tradition also going on in Venice Beach. These guys were people like Lawrence Lipton, the, the title that escapes my mind right now that he wrote about the beatniks and everything that's going on there. It's a book I think Jim Morrison read. I, I, I talk about it in my book. And these guys were tough. This was the, this was not the glamorous side of beat lifestyle or the bohemian lifestyle in the 50s yeah. and 60s. The, these are people who they had no interest in getting a job, really, and they were living by the beach, and it was hard. Like, Venice Beach then was like dilapidated shacks on the, the canals were dirty, et cetera, and so forth. This, it's like the whole... So Abbott Kinney, the original founder of Venice Beach, had this whole idea to make it into the Venice of the West, like in Venice in Italy with gondolas and everything like that and the canals and all that. Then, of course, something completely different happened. All of crazy, weird America kind of moved into this, and it, it morphed into the American version of what Venice should be here in the United States with the, all the arcades and everything like that. So naturally, it drew a lot of fringe artists, beatniks, et cetera, and so forth. But they were not well known, and they didn't seem to care. They, they didn't seem to care about that they were not getting written up like you know, like Allen Ginsberg and all of them in New York City and Lawrence Ferlinghetti and it's like very elegant, beautiful shop there in North Beach. They just didn't seem to care about that. It's just amazing that the toughest beat of them all, Jim Morrison, was the one who became more famous than everybody could find out of that entire scene. So we have to remember that Jim Morrison said, wrote a statement where he said that he felt like that time in between childhood and adulthood, it, it should be a rites of passage filled with lots of games that, that are dangerous and deadly and things that really push you and everything like that. He has a real relationship with T.E. Lawrence this way. Lawrence Arabia, like, he keeps going out into the desert. Martin Scorsese is like, he's, a, he's actually a B-movie character. Like, why does he keep going out into the desert? What is he trying to prove? Why is he pushing it like this? Jim Morrison was. He was always pushing it, seeing where it would go, what would happen. Like, he's just not... And I think in doing that, his way to induce, among many other things, peak experiences. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of a self-initiation as well. So uh, particularly right. with these important developmental times, these transitions throughout his artistic life and journey, right? right. All that said, I, I think you have made the, the case very strongly that he is a secret teacher of the Western esoteric tradition. And uh, I do have more questions, and I know we have more to talk about, but we should unfortunately start to, to head towards the wrap-up. But I really want people to get this book. Again, it's Jim Morrison, Secret Teacher of the Occult, The Journeys to the Other Side by Paul Wilde. Paul, people can find you at Paul Wild. that's with uh, Y.com, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then it's innertraditions.com to order the book. People who are watching at home, you will see these links. If you are listening to it as a podcast, just go down underneath, click on the links, order the book. Hop on your favorite Doors album, read the book while you listen to it. As Paul was saying, there's a lot more resources about the Doors now, but of course we have a lot more recordings. They put about uh, six live shows a year now out on vinyl for Record Store Day. So you can, apparently anything, that every show they've ever played has been recorded. So you have a lot of Doors music to listen to, folks. Uh, Paul, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was Thank you. really fascinating, really important. We were talking about off-air that the pop culture studies have become very important. It's in the academia now. Uh, as I said, the new Doors recordings are being pumped out every year, and you've made an, an original contribution to understanding this very important figure. So I really hope that yeah. people follow your example, that this starts a, a new renaissance in, in Morrison and Doors studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, 
That was one of the original hopes of, from this book, is that it will attract more writers that are going to respond to this in different ways. Because they're just, there's each thing that I bring up in the book, you know, it could be a book in itself. It's infinite in all directions, and that's what's so great about Jim Morris. You just, as he said, it ticks off the possibilities. Absolutely. Okay, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.